<clears throat> this morning, I want to um, take this Thanksgiving weekend and sort of, because we've been marching along so fairly rigorously through the book, I want to take just a little breather and look at chapter 18, and I want to do two things. I'd like to first take two things to be thankful for from my perspective, and they were mentioned here. And um, then I want to look at the major admonition from chapter 18 to a church like Calvary Bible Church. So a, a little bit different than moving through. We did most of chapter 17 and 18 last week. If you weren't here last week, or even if you were, and you don't have it down yet, I want to give you again the easy way to think about the whole flow of the book of Revelation, and it's in three parts. It is chapters one through three, when God speaks to the church in the city, those seven churches, those are found in chapters one through three, and then the major section that we've been working through is chapter four through 18, where God judges the great city, Babylon. The great city is mentioned a lot in there. It is where the wrath of God is expressed against all ungodliness, against men and women and empires and kingdoms who suppress the truth of God and refuse to acknowledge him as he is. That is the major section of the judgment of God in chapters 4 through 18. And then the section that will begin in earnest next week, 19 to 22, in which God redeems the city and brings a new Jerusalem and a new heaven and a new earth, and he returns and makes all things right. That's what's uh, one way to look at it. Now, one thing that I mentioned last week, but I want to take a moment and, uh, and look at each of these divisions. The reason why it was broken in this way by a, a commentator by the name of Eugene Boring I hope he isn't boring, but Eugene Boring divided it this way because in each of these sections, there is a vision of Jesus, a unique vision that starts. So in chapter one in particular, there is a vision of Jesus. And if you're thinking about the way in which you look at the book of Revelation, one thing I would hope that every member of Calvary, when you think about who is Jesus, this would come to your mind because this is where he is today. When I say, what, what, when you think about Jesus, what, what image do you have in your mind of him? One of my favorite images of Jesus is on the Mount of Beatitudes where he gave the Sermon on the Mount. I've been able to stand there, uh, what, what is it perceived to be the, that mount, a couple times and think about Jesus standing there or all of his passion in the last week, I think about Jesus that way. But I think the book of Revelation was given to us to have an, another picture of Jesus that leads to worship and thanksgiving, and it's in chapter one. Beginning in verse 12, I'll give you a couple of these verses. John <clears throat> turned to see the voice that was speaking to him, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed in a long robe and a gold sash around his chest, and the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. This is John seeing a picture of Jesus, one like the Son of Man, that should trigger our minds to the book of Daniel, one like the Son of Man, but he's among the lampstands. Chapter 1, verse 20 says the lampstands are the seven churches, so he is in the midst of his churches, walking about them. I think the sash indicates that he is a high priest and royal, he rules, his hair is white for purity and wisdom. His eyes are ablaze. He can see everything that there is to be seen. Verse 15 says, <clears throat> his feet are like bronished, burnished bronze, refined in the furnace. His voice like the roar of many waters. His authority is unquestioned. In his right hand, he held the seven stars, which we're told later in the chapter are the seven churches. And from his mouth comes a two-edged sword, his face shining 
like the sun at full strength. There is a picture of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 that should be in our mind when we think about Jesus, not only the broken Savior on the cross, but the triumphant one who is glorified at the Father's right hand. Verse 17 says, John, when I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. Now, that helps us think, how was it? We're reading words, but what did John feel when he had a vision of Jesus? Dead. Like, I'm not worthy. And I love that when John felt that way, Jesus put his hand on him. Because he loves him and is compassionate. And he said, fear not, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I have authority over life and death and the grave. That's a picture of Jesus that I would want every member of Calvary to say, when I think about Jesus, I think about this. Him standing in authority, in perfect wisdom, in power, in might, it would make you die unless he put his hand on you and said, don't be afraid. I love that. And that begins God speaking to the churches. When you come to chapters 4 and 5, for the second section of chapter 4 through 18, you have another vision of Jesus for which I'm thankful. And there in chapter 5, of Revelation beginning in verses 4 and 5, there is a picture of no one being able to open the scrolls which are the judgments, and John says, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, everybody, has conquered. Like, it is finished. He has won. And this points back to his work on the cross that he has conquered so that he can open the scroll and the seven seals. He has authority. He alone is worthy to do that. Verse 6 says, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though he had been slain. It is a picture, even in heaven, glorified of not uh, here, a conquering king, but a lamb who was slain. Why does Jesus want to be presented as the lamb who was slain? We will see him in chapter 19 riding on a white horse, conquering. But here he's pictured in worth as being a lamb who was slain, seven eyes, seven spirits of God, completeness of his deity, divinity, and he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, who is God the Father. Who walks up to God the Father and takes something out of his hand? Who can do that? Your mind should think about Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God who can stand next to the Father and take from his hand this scroll. Hey, he's worthy. The next verses that I put on the screen are 9 and 10. They sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is the picture of Jesus, worthy, holy, sovereign, at the throne, next to the Father, able to take the scroll. And as we've already said, thank you to God that your wrath is perfect. He's able to execute his wrath and open the scrolls and begin chapters 4 through 18 on the unfolding of God's judgment on the great city, Babylon. Okay, that's free. These are two pictures of Jesus that should awaken in us Worship when we sing, worth in our mind that there's no one like him, these are given to us in the last book of the Bible to say that's where he is now. But we're in a broken world. We're in Babylon. Chapter 17 and 18, which we mostly did last week, are the description of Babylon 
falling and coming into judgment. The last vision of Jesus we'll see uh, next week in chapter 19, but we'll save that for next week. You'll remember in chapter 18 in verse 5, not on the screen, but it says, on Babylon's forehead, on the woman's forehead, on the prostitute, the unfaithful one, was a name written, Babylon the great mother of all prostitutes in earth's abomination. And John is using this vivid language to get a reaction, to, to get us to think something dramatic, that as beautiful as this world system is and can be, it has an underbelly of corruption and evil and unfaithfulness to God. It's as if every kingdom of this world ultimately becomes unfaithful to God, and that's why he's going to come and turn the kingdoms of this world into the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will judge them. Now, whether the Babylon spoken of in chapter 17 and 18 refers to a future kingdom led by Antichrist and the false prophet and 10 other kings or provinces, or whether in John's readership they were thinking the Babylon that you're talking about is Rome and it's terrible, and it's going to fall, and it did, or whether John is talking about because Babylon is the mother of all other unfaithful kingdoms. There are many kingdoms for all times that always show up. It's not limited to the past, the present, or the future. It's a portrait of what kingdoms become when they refuse to submit to God in heaven And they begin to display all of the marks of Babylon, of a sense of invincibility and luxury and immorality and uh, oppression and exploitation. All of this is spoken, I think, by John to say that, that Babylon is an evil empire in the end and I think in every, in every day. One commentator put it this way, because chapter 17, verse 5 says that Babylon is the mother of all prostitutes. Babylon, whatever Babylon John was facing, it wouldn't be the last one. And there would always be more to come if it was Rome or other kingdoms, which is why it is possible for us in 2023 to wake up and realize that we are living in Babylon. So let's look at what John is going to say to the church in chapter 18, and particularly in verse 4. In John chapter 18 and verse 4, John says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, Babylon. My people, lest you take part in her sins, come out of her. Disassociate with the Babylon around you. Do not engage in her idolatry. Don't compromise. Her sins are many. She's indulged in luxury and immorality and pursued her own glory. If you look down in your Bible, we'll leave this on the screen, but you look down At verse 7 in chapter 18, it says of Babylon that she glorified herself living in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart Babylon says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. You get the sense that John is portraying this power, this empire, this city of Babylon as being absolutely self-sufficient without any regard for the one true sovereign over every kingdom of the world. I sit as a queen. I will never mourn. My kingdom will never come to an end, but it does. Now, the warning to the believers in the first century was this voice, come out of Babylon. So if we're living in a Babylon, how many of you think we might be living in a Babylon-esque kind of a world? Yeah. So this is for us. Just think for a minute. How do you come out of Babylon 
and be this distinct church. The word church in the Bible is used just a number of times, but it comes from the Greek word ekklesia, ek means out, kaleo means call. So what is the church? The church is the called out group of followers of Jesus. We've been called out of the world system. So when John says, come out of that, we want to ask the question this morning, how do you come out of Babylon? Because we can't leave the, the earth, but we have to live in the world, but not be of it. So I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament. If you want to turn in your Bible to the book of Daniel that we were in earlier this year, I want to show you from Daniel's life three ways to come out of Babylon slash boulder. Okay? Or the United States. Or whatever the influence of Babylon is that we have to face, how do you come out of it as God's called out church and live among it? Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to give you three ideas. And we're going to take it from the life of Daniel because he was the original one who was taken into captivity to the real city in the Old Testament called Babylon. And he was brought into captivity with many other Jews who were taken from Israel into captivity in Babylon. And there are three lessons I'd like to share with you from Daniel's life on how to come out of Babylon. In chapter 1, Daniel is faced with a dilemma of how will he live under the authority of the king, Nebuchadnezzar, who is trying to force him into compliance with the new values of Babylon, very different than Jerusalem. And in chapter 1 and verse 8, we simply read that after being encouraged to partake of the new life in Babylon, Daniel resolved in his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank. My principle that I wrote down in my notes is Daniel did not defile himself with the king's delicacies. And he resolved in his mind that he would not cross this line which brought him over his commitments as a Jew, not to eat certain things or to overconsume in certain ways, the king's delicacies. Now, to be honest with you, how does that help us in 2023? Because how many of you are being forced to consume the king's delicacies? Well, you're not, but are they in front of you? They're in front of all of us. Whatever that might be, I would suggest that there is an influence in the world for us to consume certain things, whether it be the values or the entertainment or the foods or the overconsumption of substance that are always before us that Daniel made a resolution to say, I'm going to stand out in the way that I consume certain things that I will not be like all of the rest of the world and he resolved in his heart to do that. You think that's a word for us today in 2023? Just to have a measure about us? I do. Now there have been ways that the church over the centuries has tried to implement this. How do you come out of Babylon when it's right there in front of us? Well, let's start a monastery. Who's in? Oh, well, you know, there's something appealing to that, but I don't, I'm not sure that's what we ought to do. Or the Essenes in the second century went out to live in the desert and they just said, I'm going to escape the world by leaving it. And the Amish do a pretty good job of resisting all technology and live in isolation. And um, that's an option. For most of us, it's not a realistic option that we would go live. Well, some of you live in the foothills and you, you get away as far as you can. But the idea of being here, we're, we're going to see that Jesus wanted us to stay in the world, but to draw a line about certain things. And I would just encourage you to pray about what am I consuming right now that might be more like the world and less like the church 
that God is building. In chapter 3 of Daniel, we find a second principle. In chapter 3, you'll remember that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are being compelled to bow down and worship idols. So the way I put it is don't bow down to the king's idols. Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a, fir- a fiery furnace. But before they went in, they said, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand. That's code for he's going to deliver us. We'll never see you again. Even if we go in the furnace and we die, that's a delivery. But if he doesn't deliver us, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That is, this Babylon in which we live in has certain idols that are propped up and we are pressured to bow down to the idols of this present world. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to themselves, I will not bow down. What will it be for those of us living in 2023 that we would say, this is an idol I will not bow down to? Can I pry a little bit? What do you think are the idols? What are the idols? of America in 2023, money, wealth, materialism, consumption. Call it what you wish, but we're entering into a season of consumption, into Christmas, bombarded with, uh, I like that Black Friday was pretty dark. It it didn't work. There, There were a lot less people on Black Friday this year. So I mean, one of the ways is to sort of turn down consumption, starve greed, and cultivate generosity. This is what's in mind in the heart of Advent, by the way. Push down greed, cultivate generosity, because generosity is not a value of our present world. There are other idols, prestige, approval, the approval of other people, pleasure, sports. I mean, it's all around us. Now, in this case, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, let's admit that their delivery from the furnace was unusual. And there were many martyrs in their day, and there were many martyrs that are described in the book of Revelation. And in the end, many people will lose their life by taking a stand against the Babylon of their day. But in this case, God honored them because they refused to bow down. Are there any idols that are rising up in our hearts that we should say no to? Holy Spirit, help us to know what those are. Daniel tells us these two principles. And the last one is in chapter 5. Excuse me, 6. In chapter 6, And here, Daniel is being faced with another compulsion to bow down to an idol, to pray to a statue, and he refuses to. Even though it was the law of the land, Daniel made a commitment that he would disobey his government if it compelled him to do something that God forbid him to do. So when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, that whenever the music played, everybody had to bow down to this statue and make petition only to it, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open toward Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. I would say that one of the ways that we come out of Babylon is to remember the things, the habits of devotion to God, perhaps that we did at the very beginning. It's possible to be a Christian and to sort of drift away from the things that you once did when you came to know Jesus. What would those be? Maybe when you became a Christian, you just voraciously devoured the Bible, and maybe your Bible's been sitting alone. Or you prayed regularly, three times a day Daniel prayed. Or maybe you set aside a time 
to go without certain things so that you would awaken a hunger for God. Or maybe you, you became good at telling people about how the Lord had changed your life and being evangelistic in the way you share your faith. Or maybe whatever it is that you used to do at first, you come to do again at the very beginning. Daniel didn't stop practicing the habits of devotion. So how are you doing on those? Those things that cultivate your spiritual life, Daniel was committed to doing those. Those are at least three principles that I think you can find in the book of Daniel for a person who really was in a Babylon, the real city in the Old Testament, and he had to be distinct and called out from it. What will it be for us in Boulder, Colorado, or wherever it is you live? How will you be distinct from all of the values and impulses of the empire we are to be God's distinct, called out church in the world? Come out from her, lest you participate in her sins. This is a dominant theme throughout all of the New Testament. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul told the Roman church, beautiful words, do not be conformed to this world. How do you not be conformed to this world? You be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is, that you let God shape your values, God shape your commitments, and you transform your mind through what you're doing right now, listening to the words of God preached, and listening to the word of God yourself. Don't be pressed into this world that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. John spoke in Revelation, and he wrote another three little letters, and in 1 John chapter 2, he put it this way, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father, everybody, is not in him. Like you, Your heart is for God. All that's in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, it's of the world. And the world is passing away. Whoever said that earlier, you know, we know how the story ends. This world is passing away. Babylon is doomed and all of its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So I always want to call you on this Thanksgiving weekend. Let's give our hearts to him, to him. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to read the George Washington Proclamation on Thanksgiving in 17, um, what was the year, 1789. If you've not had the chance to read that, I want to encourage you to read it today. It is God glorifying with multiple, multiple references to God Almighty, our founding president called on the nation of the United States of America to thank Almighty God for His many signal blessings and to beg for forgiveness for our many national and other transgressions. That's a good way to start a nation. If you want to draw a comparison, there was a proclamation that was put out this week by the present administration not throwing stones, but you look at them. What is absent? A single reference to God. A single reference to transgressions of a nation, no surprise. And this closing line, we are grateful for our nation and the incredible soul of America May we all remember that we are the United States. There is nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. Now, when you remove that from any reference to God, it's got the flavor of Babylon to me. That I don't need God, and I don't have to speak of my transgressions, and we can do whatever we want. I'm just saying, and I don't mean to cast stones on any particular president, I'm saying that the culture of our world is we don't need God. Now, we are the church. We do need God. 
And we must say, I will not consume the delicacies of this world without thought of God. I will not bow down to its values and idols. And I will cultivate in my own life the practices of devotion to the one true God while I'm living in this world and until he comes because I know how the story ends. Let me show you one more verse, and then we'll close. When Jesus was leaving earth in John chapter 17, he made a final prayer for his disciples and for all of us. And this is what he is praying to his Father. I have given them, that's you, that's all of us, every follower of Jesus, Jesus has given to us his word. And the world has hated them because it hated them. because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. He's not going to take us out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. We're going to keep living here, but Jesus prayed that God the Father would keep us from the evil one. Come out of Babylon, be kept from there. They are not of this world. Why? Because we belong to God. Just as I am not of this world. And the way this will happen is sanctify them by thy word, by by your truth. Your word is truth. Listen, there is a pathway for living in the United States of America today as God's redeemed people who are distinct from the values of the empire And it begins with saying, I know Jesus is on the throne. I know he's worthy. I know he's holy. I know he sees everything. Those two visions of Jesus shape our life to say, we are a distinct people for his glory. You with me? That's our call. So let us, by God's grace, do just that. Let's stand together for closing prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for the word of God that shows us your sovereignty from the beginning of creation to the new creation coming at the end of the age. We need your wisdom to live in the day we are. We live in a world, and we belong not to this world, but to you. Will you just press in on our soul and mind what decisions we should make in light of what we've heard today to be a distinct people who live in this present world. And may it be that as we live in this world, we will show forth the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we will be a blessing of God to the world here by living a distinct Christ-honoring life. And Lord, I pray for strength to anyone who needs to say no to something they've been a part of that they know is not in keeping with the will of God. May this be a day in which we just make decisions for God that say, I'm I'm following Jesus, the Lord of all creation, the Lord of my life. And so, Lord Jesus, to you be glory in our life. And Father, to you be praise for being the sovereign one over everything of our life. And Holy Spirit, will you work in our soul and mind to give us perseverance of faith to act on these things that you've spoken to us today. And to you, triune God, be glory in our life today and forevermore, we all pray and everyone said, amen. Amen.